focus on not what you saw in the film at all. Um, we use organic methods to grow vegetables of all types, um, not in a big monoculture, as of course you saw in the film with the soybeans. We've got um, about 200 varieties growing on about three acres. So if you can imagine, it's, it's very diverse um, so that we can rotate those throughout the field. Thanks. So that we can rotate those throughout the field um, and get some of the biological benefits that you get from that to the soil, to pest impacts, um, to weed growth, et cetera. Um, our marketing is also quite a bit different. Talking to, talking to neighbors um, who grew and sold through the commercial outlets, um, essentially you, you grow your vegetables or, or whatever you're growing, you sell it to a middleman, um, perhaps you even pay to ship it to that middleman, they then ship it on to um, where it's gonna be sold and in his, gosh, he's about 85 years old now, um, in his career of doing this, if the prices dropped after he already sold his product, they would just ship it back and, and then he'd have to pay. There was no problem with the product, it was just um, a, a money issue. And so that's one, that's one, I guess, small peek into how food is traditionally commercially marketed. Um, through the CSA, or Community support Supported Agriculture, that we use, however, we sell directly to consumers, not just at farmers markets, but um, people, members join our farm for the entire season, from um, the beginning of June until the end of October. They're getting uh, diverse bags of groceries, bags of produce, um, directly from our farm. It's not being shipped from California. Uh, it is not being sprayed with um, pesticides. We're using GMO um, varieties. And the benefits for my farm are, are great. Um, last year was a, a really good example because we had a flood and it would have been economically very difficult for us to get through the season, but these members who had bought into the CSA model, they supported us. They, they brought us cookies, they gave us hugs, and, and not only economically, but also supported us because it, it was a hard time. Um, so I think that's really quite a big difference being able to get your food from someone that you know, from a piece of land that you know, um, as compared to you know, the mystery, which is what, what you're getting at the grocery store in a lot of cases. Um, I, think, I think that Nancy also wanted me to speak a little bit to, um, as a woman, why farming is important. And traditionally, of course, um, the farmers were women it's not, it's not that way now as much in the United States, um, but it is still in, in the developing world to, to quite an extent. Um, I think there's just a belief that, that children and people should have good food uh, that, that brought me to the work. I also en enjoy being outdoors. Um, I don't know if that's a male, female thing so much. Um, I think that's about everything I wanted to mention. I also, um, I think one other thing that Nancy had said is how to get uh, this sort of produce. You can go to localharvest.org and find CSAs. Um, just put in your zip code wherever you're at, whether it's California or Michigan, and find uh, a multitude of different CSA farms or fruit farms or whatever you're looking for. Um, and I've also got pamphlets uh, on a table outside if you'd like to pick one up. We do have, I think, 12 shares in Grand Rapids open at this time if you're interested for 2009. Okay, thank you, Katie. Um, Jill and Mary. <coughs> Uh, 
Uh, we are the farmers of Crane Dance Farm, uh, Mary and Jill. And um, in complete opposite of everything that you saw, we are a very small, sustainable, diversified livestock farm, um, which is quite challenging uh, in itself. And we've certainly had challenges being women um, in what is a, a male-dominated field, so to speak. Um, we try to do everything we can to not support the industrial agricultural complex. And it, that in itself is a challenge. Trying to get um, grains for our animals that are not GMO um, is very difficult. And sadly, uh, we just lost one of our organic farmers. Oh. Ironically, he got pancreatic cancer and Three week, two and a half weeks after his uh, diagnosis, he was gone. So fortunately along the way, we have captured a few other farmers' interests and started them on the path from GMOs to, quote, conventional seeds, which are not genetically modified but are not, uh, not open pollinated. And um, we actually have one that's made the cross into open pollinated. He was all excited. He said, I got some got some corn seed that I'm going to grow. It's, it's a yellow den. I'm like, oh, read yellow den. I'm like, good. <laughs> the big challenge with that is um, when you grow corn or any other crop that is not genetically modified, the wildlife love it. Um, so we anticipate a lot of deer problems. We're going to try to put electric fence around it. We live in Barry County, and there's a, no shortage of deer. I first learned about this open pollinated, the difference of open pollinated seed, uh, probably six years ago. I had a little, maybe acre and a half field that I'd been planting different cover crops and I had maybe seven pigs at the time. And then I'd fenced in, put the pigs in there, they'd eat the, eat the little crop and till it under, I'd go spray something else on there. You get up so tall, I'd put the pigs back in. I'd done that for a few years, so the fertility in that particular field from what was sand had gone very high. And I planted some open pollinated corn from, uh, from a farm in Sparta. And that corn grew like I'd never seen. Literally, the ears were above my head. I, I have a picture like this, and I'm standing, and the, the corn is three feet above me. Well, let me tell you, the raccoons, the possums, the deer, they were doing everything they could to take down my electric fence. And so I said, okay, well, i got to let the pigs have it or I'm going to lose it. So I put my seven pigs in there thinking, hmm, you know, two, three weeks, about five days. They ate that entire field. I couldn't get them to eat anything else. I mean, I'm throwing apples in there. They're usually apples, we say they make pigs dance. But this corn that was open pollinated was so delicious to them that there was nothing I could do to stop them from eating it. So um, things are very different. We actually brought a little video, it's just pictures of our farm. Um, not sure how they'll do on a really big screen. We've only shown them on little TVs. So just kind of just to kind of get a little tour of the diversity of the animals and, and what the farm looks like. And really. also, the, also the difference between what you saw in the film and what you imagine as being associated with the film in the big business of farming to, um, to the two of us who are really the faces of the small farmer, um, the small local, very small, sustainable, humane local farmer. And it's, uh, it's quite a contrast. Enjoy. Oh, oh, McDonald had a farm, E-I-E-I-O. Farm, he had a duck, E I E I O, with a quack quack, here and a quack quack, there, here and a quack, there, quack, quack, everywhere. <laughs> Old MacDonald had a farm, E I E I O, e -I -O. and on his farm he had a cow, E I E I O, with a here and a there, here and there, everywhere, with a here and a there, here and there. Everywhere, <laughs> old MacDonald had a farm, E-I-E-I-O, and on his farm he had a dog, E-I-E-I-O, with a here and a there, here and there, 
everywhere, rock, rock. with a moo, moo. here and a moo, moo. there, here and moo. there and moo. everywhere, moo. with a quack, quack. here and a quack, quack. there, here and quack. there and quack. everywhere, quack, quack. old MacDonald had a farm, E-I-E-I-E-I-O, and on his farm he had a pig, E-I-E-I-O, with a here and a there, here and there and everywhere with a here and a there, here and there and everywhere with a here and a there, here and there and everywhere with a here and a there, here and there and everywhere. Old MacDonald had a farm, e i e i o. job, everybody. We've only got time for one more animal. Hey, kids, what are some of your favorites? <laughs> Wait, hang, hang on, hang on. I don't think we have time for all of those animals. So, why don't we put them into one verse, like this. Old MacDonald had a farm, E-I-E-I-O, -E with a here and a there, here and there and everywhere with a here and a there, here and there and everywhere with a here and there, here and there and everywhere. Well, that is our farm, and as Jill said, we are livestock farmers. We raise beef, lamb, pork, goat, duck, poultry, geese. ducks, geese, turkeys, chickens, and heirloom eggs, and uh, just about everything except for horses. And the interesting thing about that is that people who think that uh, when we go to the livestock auctions to buy our hay and straw. Um, people always say, if they don't know us, they say, oh, you guys must have horses because only women have horses. Women don't do the kind of farming that we do. And it's, it's uh, pretty amusing that uh, people don't expect that uh, two women such as we are actually um, doing the work of raising, not only doing the farm work of raising these um, animals, but also doing the marketing work because we are also the marketers. And one of our motivations for doing what we do is the fact that uh, we also need to eat clean meat. And uh, w maybe the best way of doing that is to raise your own. And we are fortunate to be able to be in the business of doing this on our small, um, very small farm. And I, I talked a little bit about the grain. And the reason that um, we try to actually source directly from farm other farmers our grain is because, one, we live in an area that prior to this economic downturn, development was huge. So in order for our farm to be sustainable, we really needed to have other farmers around us. As farmland gets eaten up, it gets harder and harder for farmers to farm. Two, we want to know what we're feeding our animals because if we don't have control over that, we don't know that what we're growing is any different. So if we just went to the feed mill and said, well, I need, you know, three tons of 16% hog feed and, you know, some layer mash and some grower, we wouldn't have any control over the minerals or whatever other additives are in there. So we get our minerals from Paul and Nancy. We know they're good, clean minerals. I actually had a friend who was pretty driven to get her diet clean, and she actually had horses, but 
She took samples from the three local mills, and I don't know what all companies they were. One was Purina for sure. She took those and sent them to a lab, and they came back, all of them, with a pretty good percentage of heavy metals. Now, if our animals eat heavy metals, we're going to eat heavy metals. So um, having the grinder, having the tractor, buying grain from our neighbors is all part of the sustainability, and it's part of how to know your food is clean. The humane issue is another big issue. Um, we're, we're very um, fortunate that we have a, a great um, pig slaughtering facility that I think we could probably have humane certified. And all of that's really important to us, shipping of our animals. We have a livestock trailer that when we pull it out into the field, our animals come running because they're used to it. They jump on it because they're going to get apples or you know a special kind of hay or something. It's a treat. Or they're looking for a new visitor to the farm, which is exciting. And um, so that whole association with loading onto a trailer where a lot of times um, it can be very brutal what people do to get animals just on a trailer. Um, ours, you know, hop on, it's, it's no big deal. And I really believe that, you know, personally, um, I'd be a vegetarian if I, if I didn't know that our meat came from animals that had great lives. You know, we always kind of joke that the humane part of the farming has to do with the animals, not the humans, because we work pretty hard. But um, we want to know it's clean, and we want to do everything we can to make sure they have a great life, which comes back around, and this is the last thing I have to say, is the name of our farm, Crane Dance Farm, be, was uh, inspired by a pair of sandhill cranes who are back on our farm, and actually Sunday we got to see them start to do their dance. They have a very elaborate mating dance. Um, we wanted to make sure that no matter what we did on our farm, that we didn't disrupt that home nesting ground for those cranes. So that was a little reminder, and after we named the farm, we found out that in Eastern philosophy, the dance of the cranes represents the joy of life. So the full circle. We want to make sure our animals have that. Thank you, Jill and Mary. <clears throat> Please jot down your questions, because we're going to have time. Um, our last panelist is Sue Meerman. Sue? I have to put my panel out here right away for you to see. Can you see it there? Um, I come from Grass Fields LLC, and our main thing that we are producing right now for you to know is our cheese. I come from a dairy farm, so actually I can go back just a little bit and say when I was a child, I grew up on a farm, and then I met my husband um, after I, while well, I was in nurses training, so actually I went here to GRCC for a little bit with um, Butterworth Hospital Training. But I realized as I was working in the fields with the tractor, along with my husband, that God had placed me in the perfect occupation for me because even as a child coming from a farm, I did a great deal of that dri driving tractor for my own dad. And it was just a joy to be outside and to do the things that I enjoy so much. I like to also, um, as a woman, I'm sure, nurture life and Therefore, I really enjoy the new life that you see on a farm. <coughs> so that's the place I come from. Um, I have, I was married and I have five children and then my husband passed away about a year, a little more than, almost two years ago now. And uh, that's the reason I'm a farmer. <laughs> I'm still a farmer as a woman. But I have five children, so three of my five children are now helping us on the farm uh, as Actually, um, they've taken over the farm, and the land belongs to me, but my three sons are now the LLC. Then I have one of my two daughters works most full-time on the farm, and the second daughter works just a bit part-time. <coughs> so our whole family is involved on the farm, and that makes it real special, too. Not only do we have the dairy cows, um, but we 
about in 1991, we went to uh, grazing our cows, and it's called rotational intensive grazing, where we move our cows from one place to another pasture every day so that they get a new place to eat grass from, and it keeps the grass being used as it should be and then comes back around in about a month, they'll come back onto the same piece again. And that also would be referred to maybe we're grass farmers even more so than dairy. <coughs> but we use the cows to do that. But you also have lambs that we take care of the grass with as well as uh, pigs. And we have chickens that we take care of the grass with. Our youngest son, when he was 10 years old, started working with chickens. And he's now 21. So he's got chickens that lay eggs and chickens that he moves around in the pastures to take care of the pasture and he uses them and for meat that he sells. As far as numbers, I think um, he's got his second batch of 800 baby chicks for this year for layers. So he's got a lot of eggs to move this year. <coughs> and as far as the broilers, he'll probably do, um, I'm not sure his numbers this year. Probably 1,000, 1,200. And then our cows, for numbers, um, we're working on 130 cows for milking at this time, but we'll be increasing this year, which is not necessarily what people want. But, I mean, as far as the market is concerned, but we are organic now as of about a year and a half ago, two years ago, May. We were able to be um, or certified organic as a farm. So not only um, do we have the no hormones, no antibiotics, no steroids, um, all of our feed has to be organic certified, as well as all of our pastures that all the animals go on. Not all of our products do we call organic because we've chosen to focus on the milk and the cheese being organic at this time. But because of expenses, we don't buy organic feed as additional feed for the chickens or for the pigs or the lamb, or actually for the beef. So the milk is the only thing that actually comes out certified organic. So there's advantages to all of them. Um, we're different from conventional, obviously, because even through the history of my farming with my husband, uh, we were conventional farming up until 1991 with our animals all confined inside the barns where they had free stalls they could go in and out of, but then go in and get milked, and then they didn't go back out on, they didn't go outside the barns any time of the year. But of course, as um, grazing, where they go out on the pastures, they're out on the pastures all year round now, and not confined inside the barns at all. So that's a huge difference. The commercial, of course, is mainly always inside barn. Um, as far as different from corporate, we're, uh, obviously family owned and very small. I think you would call a corporate farm something with a few thousand cows at this time. <coughs> uh, Nancy asked the question about why is it important um, that you support us. I guess our response to that is I think it's important to you that you know where your food is coming from, that you know um, what the farm is, and that is one reason, like, after we started making our cheese, which was in 2002, we have a little store on our farm, and we invite people to come out there. They can buy things. All of you could come out on uh, just a few days a week for our sake, but um, getting the products that we have on our farm, at our farm, so you can see where it's made. And I also think that it's really a neat thing to think about being local as to where you get your food, because it keeps our money dollars right here in, in this area rather than giving your money to several different people on the way going to California and bringing back things. So in that sense, I think of local as being very important. Um, the next question she asked is why as a woman, I guess mainly because I married a farmer and I did that purposefully. I believe it's just a gift of God that I was able to be on the farm. And why I'm keeping on with it, it is still my living. Uh, the farm gives me the support that I need to stay in uh, to have economic, you know, ability to do that. Um, one reason I became a nurse is that I 
wanted that as a backup to say if something happened to my husband, I could always go into nursing. And in my case, um, I didn't actually practice as a nurse, and I still have my license, but I wanted to stay with my husband and help him on the farm and just really enjoy that with him, which I did. And at this time, I don't have that great desire to go into nursing now because I'm still doing a great deal of the management on the farm in the sense, only in the sense of the bookkeeping and making sure that subjects are brought up that need to be, but I'm working hard to let the three boys who are now managing the farm and own the, the limited liability company aspect of it all to make the decisions that I can step back because I'm not gonna be there for every, forever. Um, where can you find our product? Our product as uh, cheese is in several stores here in Grand Rapids. I did bring a list. <laughs> and I could put it out there on the table, but our product here, um, not only can you come out to the farm, um, but you can go here in Grand Rapids and find it at um, Art of the Table here in downtown, uh, Kingmas Market out on Plainfield, Forest Hills Foods uh, on Cascade, Fulton Street Market, um, the Harvest Health on Cascade, the Maria Catrips here in Grand Rapids, and uh, Moker Orchards there, and then there's other places, uh, Grand River Grocery, there's um, the place in Granville that's, um, I don't have that entirely organized here, um, across from the mall, DeRue's Market. So there's several places that carry our cheese, and some of those also carry our eggs. There's also stores in Holland that carry our eggs specifically. Um, we go to the Holland Farmer's Market to take our products. So those are places that you can find what we produce on our farm. Um, mostly we sell the cheese outside the farm and eggs, but not the meat so much. So um, we also have a little area where I'm going to mention... Um, we sell cow shares, so a person could come buy a share of our cow on the farm, and it's specific cows, and then you can take the milk from that cow, cow and do whatever you want to with it. Um, that's a little bit different business, but it's all taking place on our farm, and my son and daughter-in-law handle that. It's called Green Pastures. We have a website you can go to to learn more about our place, and I have um, business cards that you're welcome to take for the website that's also listed at the bottom of this board. Um, and I'll be glad to help you with any questions you might have when we get to that part. <laughs> okay, thank you, Sue. Um, I'd like everybody to move up, please, because it's time now for questions and answers. And what we're going to try to do is to get some real positive responses as far as what we all can do to support local farmers, and improve our local community. So if you move up to the podium, you get the uh, microphone. One thing before we start with the uh, questions and answers, I want to talk a little bit about the importance of economics. Um, there's a term called parity, and it used to be very important because it had to do with what's called raw material production. And the idea is that our creator has given us real wealth. And that comes through farming, it's through the fishy, fisheries, um, the forests, the minerals, the oil, all the things that are there for us to take and then to produce products and to pass it on down through until it gets to the final consumer. The parity idea is that the raw material producer must be able to make a profit so that all the expenses are covered and there's still some money to left over to be able to continue and to go again. 
And one of the things that has happened with our government policies has been to do away with parity pricing. And what we have instead is debt and war. And one of the reasons why it's so difficult for local small producers to make a living is because it's very difficult to say, well, I've paid this amount of money to get this product to market, so I need this amount of money to stay in business. And we have been flooded with, quote, cheap food. Water is subsidized, fuels are subsidized, the big, big corporate farms are subsidized so that it is not equal. It is not parity. And this is one of the reasons why it's so difficult to pull yourself away from the convenience and the, quote, cheapness of convenient foods in our uh, restaurants and in our supermarkets to say, no, I need to support a local economy. I need to support local producers. So I just needed to bring that issue to a, a real paramount part of the discussion because it is overlooked with our government policies. So who has some questions? I'm going to hold a mic because we are going to be um, recording this and then you can address it to the whole panel or anyone in particular. Okay, so uh, in my family, we have done this for a long time, the idea of supporting local produce. Um, a lot of um, Harvest Health, that type of thing out in Hudsonville. Um, my daughter is a fanatic about this stuff over in Ann Arbor. The thing I'm concerned about is given the degradation of farmlands uh, across the country, um, the business of agribusiness running the show and all the rest of that, how can, or it seems to me like it's an almost insurmountable problem when we talk about the macro economy, the idea of reconversion back over into local type farming on a massive level in order to save farmlands. Um, there's also the problem of um, development, as one of you mentioned, um, which I think will continue the minute that the economy comes right back because big money comes in. And I'm not sure if you guys have answers any more than I do, but the question I have at that point in time is, has anyone thought through the kinds of steps that need to be done in order to create an economy of conservation and an economy in which we are um, doing this on a level that would feed everyone and not just a few? That's the question I would have. Who would like to address, Who would like to address that? <laughs> Sue, if you're saying yes. <clears throat> yeah, it is. I do think that when we consider local, there have to be a lot of local places to really supply everyone. And I guess we're just stepping in to fill in our little spot. I also know that on our website, my oldest, who's very you know, involved in Farm Bureau, has a disclaimer on there to say, you know, we need each other because we can't feed all the people in the world. Therefore, we do need the bigger farmers as well as the small. We don't like some of their practices, but people have choices. They want really cheap food. That's what they go with. And that's what he wanted to say in there. We're working together. We're not trying to say we're the only ones either. Oh, I understand that. It's consumer. You know that <coughs> there is a movement <laughs> that's happening, and you're probably well aware of it. There's, um, you know, people who are in the slow food movement, people who are have, you know, read Michael Pollan and, you know, um, 
the, the different authors, and everywhere you're finding articles about eating healthy. And you know, I don't think that there's probably an either or kind of a way, but I think that public, public consciousness and education are extremely important. People who are in the know um, are willing to commit to going to where they have to go to buy foods that are healthy for their families. Um, I think, you know, one of the sad things is that the, um, what is the average age of the, the average farmer is like 57 years old. There are, you know, Katie's younger and she's getting into farming and, you know, but there are a lot of older people who are the farmers and a lot of their children are not taking over the reins. And so, you know, how to grow the, the small farm movement is, is just what Sue said, you know, you, to, to put more farms, you know, back into business. But it's really hard when, you know, we don't receive any monies from anybody. Um, it's, it's basically what we do and it, it's, it's a hard existence to etch out. Um, we, we do what we do because we're committed to it, whether we'll be doing it. Last summer we thought we might not make it through the summer because of the cost of corn just going <coughs> way sky high. Like, and fuel. And, and fuel. fuel. Commodities. Yeah, and commodities. And we thought, you know, are we going to be able to, to make it through the summer? Are there going to be people coming to the Fulton Street Market? Because that's where we do. Um, we market in two uh, major places. One is the Fulton Street Market. Um, every Saturday in th from May through December. And also we're members of the West Michigan Online Co-op. All of uh, us are. Yeah. All of us are. Of us. And um, that we're third in the nation for an online co-op system. And um, it's taken a few years, but it's really working out very well. And uh, it certainly does help us during the winter months. You know, but I, I think that's one of our concerns, you know, as farmers, you know, who's going to take over? Who's going to be there when, you know, we're having a hard time finding a, you know, farm help, uh, let alone an intern, you know, who is willing to commit to this concept. And it's hard to be young and to not have resources um, in to think about going into farming. But it's a good question you asked. It's a tough one. I think there are a lot of things that get in the way, but I absolutely believe that we could have local food, especially in Michigan. I mean, we can grow just about everything in Michigan. I mean, we don't really have to have oranges. <laughs> and if we can learn how to put food up, and even with greenhouses in Michigan, with passive solar greenhouses, we can grow really all the food in Michigan that Michigan needs to consume. And why would we spend our dollars shipping them out of it, especially now in this economic time? We need to keep those dollars in Michigan. The, we have a lot of things that work against us with that, though. Um, uh, one of our mentors is Joe Salatin, who really moved the grass-fed, uh, grass-based farming movement along. And um, he, he calls it the FDA, FDA, and the U.S. DA. <laughs> and a lot of the policies that the FDA and the U.S. DA have work against us. They make it really hard. I mean, what the Mearmans have done to get raw milk, organic cheese in the hands of consumers without doing it under the table at night is amazing. That's hard work. And the fact, maybe you guys don't know about raw milk. You learned about bad milk on this film, but raw milk is the best health food you can probably have, especially if it's on grass and especially if it's organic. The only way to get around, because the government, i.e., Monsanto, or the FDA, or the US DA, or um, yeah, well, Conagra, or all those big ones, they don't really want farmers to be able to get their products right to consumers because that cuts them out. So, and gosh, what's going to happen to the pharmaceuticals if people start getting healthy? Right. I mean, there it, it's really interwoven. The biggest single challenge despite all of that and, and all the, the farm payments, which you know I'd be like, get rid of them. Get rid of the farm payments. Open the market because then we would have a lot more parity because the factory farms wouldn't be able to survive without all the laws and all the payments that help them and the prices of food would get up to probably where they belong. 
but we need farmers. It's really sad that we lost an organic farmer. He was only 60. Now a lot of people are like, well, that's probably close to retirement age. No, it's not. Not when you're a farmer. <laughs> I uh, actually have a degree in agriculture, and when I was going to school learning about agriculture, and I didn't grow up on a farm, the stuff I learned scared me, and that's when I knew I had to start growing my own food. And this was pre-Monsanto. So um, somehow we need to get young people interested in farming, we need to have some kind of help in doing that because starting like we did from scraping up enough money together to buy a little farm and then trying to get fences and well, we finally have our own tractor instead of borrowing tractors and it's, it's very capital intensive um, to do livestock in particular. But I really believe that if we can get more small farmers and we can, Katie, how many acres do you farm? Um, it's seven acres in total, five tillable. Okay, and how many families do you feed? A hundred. Off five acres? Yeah, and well, three in production. Three, actually. yeah. So, I mean, it's really possible with all the acres that we have, if we start, stop doing especially ethanol, um, start using our land to produce food and treating our land in a way which will produce food without an abundance of chemicals which kill the land, and send the soil down the Mississippi, um, I really believe it's possible. Yeah, just to kind of follow up on that, um, as far as saving land for agriculture, it, it is the, in my opinion, the local producers that are the only people in a place to do that. Um, I can, I can, produce much more money on my farm with diverse practices and growing vegetables for human consumption than folks that are, you know, growing corn. I, I don't know, personally, it's a couple hundred dollars an acre of profits in corn right. when the prices are low. Um, and then in addition, instead of the difference between my, my net profit and my gross being um, chemical costs, uh, which I must say also, the, the neighbors, um, the, the farmers in my area think that, that we're getting rich because we're not paying all our money to the chemical companies. <laughs> Literally, they see the line going from income, chemical <coughs> company, out, output, you know. Um, we do have costs, and probably the biggest one is hiring people to help us out. And in Michigan's economy, I mean, it's it goes full circle and all of these things come together. Secondly, as far as um, feeding everyone, I think farmers markets have done a great job lately of uh, doing all the paperwork and things that are necessary to accept food stamps. Um, there's a farmers market on the southeast side that's done a lot of work to um, move right into a food desert where there's just literally no good grocery stores um, and folks that don't have cars because they're already in a tough economic situation can't necessarily make it to Myers. They have to go to the liquor store and pick up, you know, SpaghettiOs or whatever, whatever's available. Um, making locally grown food an alternative to that uh, was actually pretty popular um, and, and a lot of folks were getting healthy collard greens and things like that um, as an alternative to the really, really processed foods. Um, I think also the economics needs to take into account that if people are cooking in their own homes, um, people say that joining my farm is like, you know, it's like the mandatory cooking class. You're gonna have a fridge full of food that if you don't learn how to cook it, you're going to have to either put in the trash can or in your compost heap or however you deal with it. Um, if you're cooking your own food and you're not going out to eat and you're not buying um, the expensive little boxes that have the spices already with them, uh, it is possible. I'm not a high income person and I eat, I eat very well um, with very high standards for what I'm buying. It is possible if you're willing to trade the time to make it happen. Oh, <coughs> sorry.
excuse me. One other thing as far as what we can do is to look at new ways to do things. And there was a report on, I think it was NPR the other night, about a farmer in upstate New York who sells dairy products to one of the green markets in New York City. And he has um, raw milk and cheeses and butters and cream. And he, he doesn't have enough because the quality is so good and people want it. And he'd like to do a processing plan on his farm to be able to expand, but it's too expensive. So what he's doing is he's going to his customers and say, would you invest in my farm? So he's taking a model from a man who's written a book called Slow Money. And the idea is that you invest in something in your local community that is going to really make a difference. So by going to his customers, if he can get a $1,000 loan and pay 6% interest, that might be better than going into the stock market. But it's even more so because it's supporting that farmer and it's supporting something that is going to be sustainable, something that is local. And this is something that we need to look at is new ways to operate to keep our money within our community, not just with agriculture, but with many, many ways. And there's a, an organization called Local First that um, was just written up in the Lansing paper about all the wonderful things that the Grand Rapids chapter is doing. And one of the things that they do have is a little coupon book that you can purchase and then take and buy things at these other member stores. Now, if, as a farmer, it was too expensive for us to join Local First, but I certainly support what they're doing. And I know last fall they had several days where they highlighted local producers in restaurants that were serving local foods. And one of the things that Paul and I are doing is trying to do education to let people know that you really do have choices. And watching this horror film with Monsanto, there are so many positive things that really are happening. And I want to give a plug for the film that we're going to be showing two weeks from last night on the 30th called Food Fight. It's at Sanchez Bistro at 7 o'clock. It's a free showing. And it starts in California with the chefs wanting to serve food that tastes good. And they went out to farmers and said, would you grow this so that I can serve it? And Alice Waters and some of the very famous, famous chefs that have come out of Northern California are in the film, and Michael Pollan and several other activists that are really trying to educate people to making different food choices. Um, and in the very end, it interviews a senator, I think, I think he's a senator from Wisconsin who tried to make an amendment to the farm bill and say, you know, let's cut out some of these subsidies. And the film shows, of course, that it was voted down, and the congressman who voted it down, how much money they received from the lobbyists to keep the things the same as they are. So there's so many areas that we can be trying to make a difference. And food is one because we eat every day. Okay. Sure. This is a, a small one. Um, I eat a lot, I drank a lot of soy milk, and when I watched the film, all I could think of was the poison I'm putting in me. Now, I get that soy milk at Harvest Health, and that same brand is also available at Myers. How can I be sure that it's not poisonous? Is it organic? Yeah, I think so. It can't be GMO if it's organic. Okay, if it's certified organic, it's not. Okay. Uh, 
you mentioned a need for young people getting into farming. Um, how does your average college student, you know, if they wanted to do something like for the summer or, you know, how do they get into that? Are there any opportunities? I think um, if you're really interested in farming, one of the very best things to do is um, seek out an internship. Um, there, there are internships out there. Um, we're, we're looking for an intern, and uh, I think um, in order to get a real hands-on experience, you, you, that's how you can kind of figure out where your niche is. And um, as young folks looking at becoming interns, what, um, what you should have in mind is a lot of these older folks who are farmers won't be, f I mean, we joke, we, we can only kind of have a five-year plan because we can't probably keep up the pace forever. So we need somebody to get in there and learn about the operation and take it over. And we are not unique. I, I think the, the, the downside of what you're talking about, young people getting into farming, I think, you know, the, the Mearman children were probably lucky because they had a history of, you know, family being in the farming business, which means there was land, there was equipment, there was infrastructure, um, and a young farmer starting out, um, there's really none of that. If you don't have the land, you have to secure some land, and then you have to just very gradually build, you know. So, um, you know, that's the downside of it. But I think there are opportunities, and anybody who's willing to work and who loves to work outside and who loves to work with the land or in the uh, nurturement of animals. Or plants. Or plants. Um, there are opportunities. You might have to just work a little bit harder to do it, you know. And well, we've got some shoveling that needs to be done. <laughs> but, you know. I think the man back there also mentioned that MSU. My husband did go to MSU for a short course in agriculture, and um, I don't know how he didn't feel it was terribly valuable, but I thought it was. <laughs> I think he learned a lot more from it than he thought he did. He learned business economics. That part of it. And I think that MSU is also becoming, they're learning from us. <laughs> they're learning the more natural, and they're starting to do the experimenting on the things we've already gone to. So, so they know they're an organic uh, curriculum, I believe. They, yeah, I think they, they do. Yeah, yeah, the MSU Student Organic Farm um, has a year-round, I think it's a like 48-week CSA, Community Supported Agriculture. Um, they grow, grow in hoop houses and uh, also distribute stored root crops and things um, throughout the winter and then also through the summer, of course. Um, and that's a, it's a one-year program, making it a little more affordable. Um, but I, I have to concur that the way to learn about farming is, is by working on farms. I, I didn't study science or agriculture or anything in college. Um, I learned working four or five summers for other farmers. Um, I think doing the hands-on and, and seeing what's practical in a small-scale farm. Also, then you can kind of seek out what you want. Um, if your if, if you're, you're interest lies in um, permaculture, you can find a farm that does that. If your interest is with uh, livestock, you can find a farm that does that. And within that, if your interest in livestock is with rotational grazing, you can find a farm that's doing that very well. Um, whereas if, if you're getting kind of the broad college education, it's a little harder to focus down into something that you're going to be able to um, apply every day on your own farm. I also have to say that it is a hard thing to get into working on farms. Um, internships can be... Uh, can be trade for housing. That that can be, your pay can literally be that low, um, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, I, however, if you look around, um, I, I don't think I ever got paid minimum wage when I was doing that. It was about five bucks an hour, and I was always getting paid around minimum wage. Um, we at, at my farm we choose to pay minimum wage because we don't want to rip people off. But um, but I think. Too, besides the money, all that learning, you know, you're going to pay if you're going to MSU. Um, you're getting a lot on the farm as well. Also, on the issue of buying land, um, I, I think that was a huge barrier for me. 
thinking that I needed to own the land, but leasing is definitely a great option. That's how we got in. It's about a hundred bucks an acre. Um, and you can't buy land for less than three or four thousand dollars an acre, so it completely changes the the money equation to get started. And there's um, two ways to look for internships, um, both on your computer. If you just put farm internships in, I can't think of what the website is, but you'll go there. And also just um, just looking at the uh, what was the website you mentioned? There's Oh, Atra. Atra is the one. Local Harvest. If you if you go to Local Harvest and you find farms that are doing things that um, you're interested in, contact that farm. They may not have it together enough to uh, to know to advertise to advertise for an internship, <laughs> That's how or I to even have the aha moment that they should be training somebody. <laughs> you know, so it's true. You know, um, the two of us. Um, we farm all day long, and all, so many of the, the other things that we need to be doing, all of the computer work, all of the, you know, marketing. publicity, the marketing stuff, and, you know, it, it all kind of falls by the wayside, you know, if there's problems with animals, you know, and they, you know, they occur all the time, you know, you've got your day all planned out, and then all of a sudden your neighbor calls and says, your sheep are eating my berries. And so you drop everything, and you go and you take care of the sheep. You get them back to where they need to be. You fix the problem. And meanwhile, you know, an hour or two has passed, and, um, you know, the day has just gone kaput. So, you know, it's, it's that kind of a, of a schedule and challenge. Yeah, it varies you know. a lot. <laughs> it varies a lot. One of, our, um, one of our friends at the market, Mary had mentioned to him that uh, we – you know, we make these lists and we never get them done. And he said, you guys are still making lists? That's self-defeating. Because yeah. <laughs> that's just kind of how it goes. Hard to plan. Yes, if you do want to find a farm that you'd be interested in, one thing is to go to the farmer's markets. And the Fulton Street Market opens the 1st of May. And just search out the farmers. They have products that might be something you're interested in and talk to that particular farmer. Um, there's also a market in Muskegon called Sweetwater Local Foods Market that's open all winter long. It's inside every other Saturday, and then in the summer it's outside. So there's, there's ways to uh, connect with farmers even in the winter. Other questions? Just a quick note. Another um, neat way to get into farming is willing workers on organic farms. This is usually a uh, work for board type trade, but it may be in an exotic place like New Zealand or um, somewhere beautiful. So, other questions? Comments? Okay, if you're interested in this film, The World According to Monsanto, it's $20. And it can be purchased through the people of Turtle Tree Seeds. There's catalogs on the um, table in the back. They're an open pollinated, many of which are certified organic or are biodynamic seeds from people in the United States and also some places in Europe. And the best thing to do is to start to grow your own. Look around your neighborhood, find a little spot that you can put some plants in get some people together. As several of us, of us have already said, it's working together that's going to make the difference. And um, I thank you for coming. <laughs>